Uh, my name is Sean Fetaplace. I am the Midwest Regional Manager for the Main Street Alliance. Uh, prior to joining MSA, I worked for President Obama, a couple of members of Congress, the One Campaign, and joined Main Street Alliance about two years ago. Main Street Alliance is an organization founded by small business leaders, including many of the folks in this room, in 2008. MSA organizes small businesses around issues that matter most to them, uh, their employees and the communities that they serve. Uh, MSA aims to build a powerful, self-funded, multiracial small business coalition and membership organization that can shift our economic narrative, uh, wield political power, and win policy reform for small business owners at the state, federal, and local level. Under the leadership of Shonda Causer, our executive director, Main Street Alliance has been able to set a strategic agenda around the issues that small business owners care most about. That in agenda includes critical issues like health care, child care, paid leave, capital access, tax fairness, and reigning in monopolies, which is what we're all here to talk about today. Our Minnesota organizer, Melissa, um, who's out back right now, is here today as well, and I know she would love to meet with you, especially if you're a small business owner, but also if you're not, if you're an economic development person, if you care about policy, care about the issues I mentioned, really want to get connected with you. And if you have, there's a little sign up on your uh, chair. If you don't have one, uh, talk to Mel before you leave. Uh, we want to make sure that we're building power, building power for small businesses all across our country. We're gathered here today to discuss the destructive impact of monopolies um, and corporate concentration on small business. Uh, I want to imagine, uh, I want you to imagine for a moment a world without monopoly power, uh, a world in which government prioritizes and nurtures Main Street small businesses um, and protects the ability of all people of all backgrounds to be able to contribute to their community. Imagine what kind of freedom that would mean for small business. That would mean access to customers, suppliers, distributors. They could sell the products or services at actual market prices. Imagine that. Um, not the prices demanded by a corporate platform. They could seek seed or expansion funds from a local financial institution, maybe a bank dedicated to supporting non-white entrepreneurs, um, women entrepreneurs, and others whose full value is not recognized often by traditional measures. In this world, small businesses would chart their own course and compete on their own terms. There is a growing movement across the United States um, to rein in monopoly power and start creating a world that looks like this. Small business owners are a part of that movement and we'll hear from them and advocates for workers today. So that said, uh, a few housekeeping uh, items. For the bios for our lovely speakers in the effort to be succinct, you can you look at the QR code, get a lovely background on them. They're all amazing people. I highly recommend you do that. Um, so with that said, we're going to go ahead and do some introductions. And so first off, we're going to start with RF Bowie. Uh, RF is a fourth generation grocer with stores in rural South Dakota. Uh, independent grocery stores are a critical part of our food system. And data shows that are, they are particularly important in small towns and communities of color. Yet local grocers have been facing a real problem with big chains, particularly Walmart and dollar stores. And I can say this, as somebody who lives in Wisconsin, I've seen this firsthand. Um, they're gaining pre preferential access to supplies, special package sizes, and better prices. Can you talk, um, RF, a bit about what you've experienced and what it means for the communities that you serve? Sure. I, I, uh, I don't know whether to be honored or nervous that I don't have anything else to say with uh, Mr. Bedoya taking all my, my <laughs> notes there. But uh, RF Bowie, we, we've got uh, 22 locations, mostly grocery and sea store throughout South Dakota. Um, all of our locations are on or near uh, Native American generations. Uh, I'm a fourth generation grocer and I've got a real passion for access to healthy foods and affordable foods. So we're going to turn 117 years this year uh, and, I, and I'm just really passionate about the customers that I serve. Um, the three areas of unfair trade practices going on today uh, that we face. The first is price discrimination and predatory prices. Um, as, as Mr. Bedoya discussed, we buy from a, a wholesaler. It's actually a co-op, which takes a lot of independents like me, packages up our orders, and able to go to these suppliers and get full truckloads of product. So uh, we can talk about efficiencies all day long, but a truckload is a truckload is a truckload. 
okay? So um, AWG is a $10 billion company, so they're no small player. Uh, they do take a small markup, and you know, obviously I'm, I'm fine with giving up an extra two or 3% to Walmart, um, but the truckloads of those products are not at the same cost. Give, just to give you a couple examples, tied 100 ounce. Regular cost from my supplier, my cost, $21. Uh, three times a year, I get to pay $19.69. So $19.69 is my cost, and if I were to bridge buy for the whole year, I could buy it $19.69. Walmart, everyday low price, $12.97. Now vendors or manufacturers used to use the excuse, uh, well, we can't guarantee that these independents are gonna run it for the same price. So they're, they're, they're saying they're dictating to the big box or dictating the chains what that uh, retail should be. So what did us retailers do? We said, we opened up our books. So we let them get, we let the vendors, the manufacturers get into our, they call it T logs, but it gets into our cash registers at night and looks at, they can see how many units we sold, what we sold them for, okay? Now we're back on an even playing field. So now if they're gonna dictate the retail, um, we should be able to buy at the same cost. Um, but nothing changed. Uh, for half the year, just six months out of the year, I get to pay $2.92 for craft salad dressing if I retail it for $2.99. Get to make seven cents. That, and that's if I bridge buy. Every other day, the other six months of the year, it's $3.77 cost. Walmart, every day, low price on craft salad dressings is $2.58. And if anybody in this room thinks that they're only making seven cents, it's just crazy. So I could tell you that us retailers are tired of the big box chains, the big box stores and chains making their margins on the backs of us retailers because that's exactly where it's coming from. Uh, second unfair trade practice that happens, it, and it's mostly in dollar store, store fa formats, is that we can't buy the same sizes. Um, Dollar General, Family Dollar, 70% of their products are consumable, okay? A lot of people don't know that, they don't think that, they just think that it's trinkets and junk. Um, but th they are a real threat to small town America. 90% of those products are smaller sizes to deceive the customer, okay? So customer is used to looking at a 50 ounce Tide uh, they may have a 40 ounce Tide that looks the exact same bottle shape. And if you're not a grocer or a really conscientious consumer, you don't realize those things, okay? But even if I wanted to compete on that level, I can't. I'm getting denied those sizes, so I can't even compete fairly to buy those, those, those products. And the third, and final trade practice that I think is unfair is probably the one I'm most passionate about is where rural Americas are disproportionately impacted by supply chain issues. My wholesaler, AWG, last article I read from them, they still have over 100 plus manufacturers that have put us on allocation. Baby formula, ramen noodles, Gatorade, sugar, Pedialyte, and I could go on and on. But yet, I can walk into a big box store or a chain and see those products stacked to the hilt. 65% of, 65 of grocery sales are from five companies. And if you live in a rural place, that should scare the crap out of you, okay? Um, in its short, when it comes to my customers, should not have to miss meals or be shorted product just because they're a rural. Pine Ridge, 90% of the people there don't have cars. 89 miles from the closest Walmart. When it comes to hunger, affordability, and nutrition, there should be no discrimination. Well, thank you very much. And uh, just to your point, uh, it was recently in Spring Green, Wisconsin. It's where Taliesin, Frank Lloyd Wright is. 
Um, it's a bustling downtown, lots of small businesses that are very healthy. They've specifically decided to not allow Dollar General uh, from a zoning standpoint to come into town. And walking through there, you can really see the impact of small businesses being able to compete on a level playing field. Um, to the questions that you spoke to that, um, can you speak to the role of policy and the challenges that your business faces as a direct result of policy choices and how it impacts the way that you run your business? Well, I, I think uh, just exactly what I talked about. One, one thing I did want to mention on Dollar General, what, where, what we face in rural South Dakota, um, this happens all the time. There are towns, small towns, that try and keep those dollar stores off. Yeah. But what happens, they'll just go right outside city limits, and then it's a two-fold problem, because yeah. now it's going to affect those businesses in that town, but yet no sales tax dollars are made for that city. Right. So, um, but ha having to deal with all, all three of those things that we just talked about, I mean, price for one, and I, and I hate to say it, but it just, we are absolutely paying for the discounts us, us retailers are paying for the discounts of those wholesalers. Um, mm -hmm. uh, not being able to compete with, with sizes, and, and that happens on every segment of the market, not just dollar, but lots of places. And then finally, access to them, which I think if, if the pandemic didn't sh show what that could mean, um, I don't know what it's going to take to be able to get something done. Is there anything else you want to add just about um, being an independent grocery store, the struggles you face? You talked about the pricing, the undercutting. Like, what do you think are some policy proposals that could be done to help to address those? Well, I, th I, think, I, I think the cost issue is, look, I, I understand that, that my stores are way off the beaten path, and I get that, you know, it, it costs more to transport that out there. Yes, I understand that. But when, when my wholesaler can't, buy the same products at the same price it just it, it, it's just not right and uh, furthermore I worry about um, who's going to sponsor that ball team who's going to donate to the church bazaar who's going to be there for the families when their house burns down to have a, a fundraising event uh, when all of guys like me are gone mm. there we can't expect big chains big box to do the right thing and during the pandemic, um, were your products given lower priority comparatively to the big box stores? Is that something you had to deal with, especially early on? Absolutely. I mean, it's just like Mr. Bedoya talked about. We, we, we could only get, you know, a formula, for instance. Uh, we could only get five cases per truck, okay? So that for us is, is 10 cases a week, the max that we could get. Well, we have Pine Ridge uh, that could go through 50. So we would have to go drive to our lower volume stores and I can't pass that on, that cost on to my customers. They, they deserve yeah. better. So it's just um, it, it it's just for lack of a better word, just doing the right thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as I've worked across mostly Wisconsin, working with small business owners, that was a huge issue early on, where folks literally couldn't get their product sold because um, paper towels and uh, you know uh, high margin products were given priority, and those small businesses no longer be able to make it to market. Uh, well, thank you very much for those remarks, and thanks thank for the work that you do. Um, uh, next, we'll go to Angela Schwestnedel. Um, Angela is a wonderful Main Street Alliance member, and we're thankful for her to be here today. And uh, she's the owner of a local independent bookstore in the Longfellow neighborhood of South Minneapolis. Your store has been around for over a decade, and you've witnessed rapid change in the industry, from consolidation in publishing to the growth of Amazon. Can you speak to how Amazon's dominance has impacted publishing and your business? Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, my bookstore is located at Lake and Minnehaha in South Minneapolis, and this is the site of where um, the third precinct was burned during the uprising in 2020 when George Floyd was murdered. Um, the neighborhood is starting to rebuild. Um, so far, n none of the independent businesses um, really had a chance to rebuild. Uh, AutoZone has rebuilt. Uh, Wendy's has rebuilt. 
The Arby's hasn't, but another national chain has come in, fast food chain has come in in their place. Um, they don't shovel their sidewalks. It's very controversial. Um, <laughs> Target has rebuilt, and Target um, actually reopened on the day that the Barack Obama memoir came out. I don't know if you remember this. It was $50. It was a really big deal. There was a lot of um, talk in the press about how this was really going to save small businesses. <laughs> um, <laughs> being able to sell this $50 book that was pretty much guaranteed to sell. Um, Target, uh, on the day they reopened in the neighborhood uh, across the street from us, offers it 30% off, um, which for us is probably um, the thing my staff is never going to forget. <laughs> um, they're going to be angry about that for years. Um, I think that uh, Target is not a bookstore. They're, they're selling books now, and they're selling a lot more books, but they're not a bookstore. If you go to their website, you can now order anything that we can get from Target. And this is because there's only one wholesaler left in the country. And this wholesaler... Um, uh, ten years ago, there were at least four, but this wholesaler is is it. Um, if you're a, an independent bookstore selling new books pretty much anywhere in the country, you're getting your books from this place. Um, and Target also gets their books from this place, and probably Walmart, and definitely Amazon. Um, I think that the past ten years, publishers have merged. And I'm not going to get into that, but that's made it more stressful to only have the one wholesaler. And that one wholesaler, if they're also shipping out books for Target and Amazon, and if they suddenly decide to increase their shipping minimums, or to start charging more for shipping, or to change their policy for whatever reason to make it more complicated or more difficult for small independent bookstores to buy from them, um, there's no alternatives. Uh, I can right now figure out a way to get by. Like I can order more direct from publishers. I can figure out um, how to shift what I buy to get around this issue of only one wholesaler. But in the Twin Cities metro area, there's over 20 independent bookstores, and we're all weird. And <laughs> if we're all going to keep being here and being bookstores, um, we need a way to be able to get the products we need to sell um, without having to resort to buying from a big box store or ordering in from Amazon, just trying to get uh, a cheaper deal than we can get from the wholesaler. Um, because it's a similar thing where um, we, can't, we can't get the product at a price um, from the wholesaler that big box stores can. Um, I think it's especially troubling to think about that if for some reason Amazon decides to buy up books and not ship them or to hold on to product until it's convenient and we can't get that product, um, what it really means for the, for the industry. I, um, I know uh, that this is a conversation I have to continually have with my customers and uh, I get tired of telling this story, even though I know that telling the story is kind of what helps them understand um, understand the business and um, why things are the way they are. Um, that's what I got. Oh, to just to speak to a bit of what you talked about, you know. Um, could you talk a little bit about the role your your store plays in the neighborhood? Um, and just since um, the murder of George Floyd, um, what 
uh, real, I mean, you talked about some of these big box stores coming back in, but a yeah. lot of the independents have not. Is that, uh, why do you think that is? Um, deep pockets. Uh, and I think uh, the city hasn't been particularly easy to work with. Um, the independent liquor store, um, I know, who's been there for 90 years and family owned, um, had the zoning rules change before they could get uh, rebuilt. Um, it's really hard to um, describe what it is to be in a community of independent books, independent businesses, because we all depend on each other and we all really, uh, it's in an ecosystem and for us to be successful, we need other small businesses to be successful and we need other businesses in the neighborhood to be doing well um, and to have them not be able to rebuild uh, is really, it's heartbreaking, um, you know. Target's there, uh, but um, I also think that uh, people don't really realize how important it is to have a small business to have, to be open so that you have somebody to come in and complain to that the other business down the street isn't shoveling their sidewalk. Because yeah. um, nobody at the city will listen to you about that. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, we're, we're just really all connected, and yeah. it's hard. And considering that there's been corporate consolidation, um, you know, I was just in a bookstore with Mel yesterday. Um, I forget the exact name, to be honest with you. Uh, it was lovely, though. And, you know, they curate, and they really are seeking to educate folks who are there about things that are really important in the community. Target's not doing that. You know, it's just like whatever the bestseller is, right? And so there's a role for in terms of democracy with small business, um, you know, based bookstores. And so, like, what role do you think your business has just in terms of informing, educating, opening people's eyes that maybe they wouldn't get from a bigger box <coughs> store? Yeah, it's tricky. I'm uh, The thing I'm most bitter about Target with is that... Uh, after the uprising they and the rebuilding, they've um, put all these beautiful murals and hired all these artists to put these murals up around their store. But um, when it, the artists wanted community input about what the community wanted to see, uh, they came to us to see if they could um, talk to people at our store <laughs> to find out what people in the community wanted on Target um, because Target wouldn't let them. <laughs> um, and that's the kind of thing that um, that's asking a lot of a small business <laughs> to provide that sort of PR for Target, in my opinion. <laughs> um, but that's what small businesses do. You know, like we're we're talking to people in the neighborhood. We know what everybody's worked up about. We know what everybody's really dealing with um, uh, in. The big box stores can't do that, and Amazon, Amazon can't do that. The beginning of the pandemic, they stopped shipping books because that wasn't um, the high priority. Yeah. Uh, they're big enough where at any point that they could change. I think the other thing that worries me with publishers is that the independent bookstore market is so small. I feel like the last I heard it was four percent of the general book market and if we ever have people in power there who decide that the indie market isn't important um, well then we're really screwed yeah. um, I don't know what we'll do well thank you for sharing your story and I uh, appreciate it can we give a round of applause to Angela And lastly, we have uh, Kali Ajama. Um, uh, Kali is from the Wood Center. Um, and just building off of Angela's remarks on Amazon, it would be great for you to describe the Wood Center's uh, work to organize, educate um, the next generation of worker leaders in Minnesota's diverse East African communities. Uh, you've organized powerful and effective campaigns around Amazon. Um, can you share more about that work and why it's so important to Minnesota's East African community? 
<clears throat> Hi, my name is Kali Jama. So I always been an organizer when it came to the East African community. I was the first Somalian generation in Minnesota back in 1991. So um, growing up in Minnesota, we realized a lot of um, Somalian was not recognized, African was not known that much. So our clothing and all that has always been an issue, especially going to school, covering up, and my parents always going to the grocery. So long story short, um, I lived in Minnesota, I moved, I came back. I'm a single parent of two, so I always work two jobs. I applied for Amazon, because um, everyone always talked about Amazon, how good it is, quick money you can make, and I started working there. As I was working there, I noticed the few couple weeks that I was there. So they hired me as an ambassador, which is like a new high orientation. You train people on the floor, teach them their rights and stuff like that. So majority of the Amazon workers are immigrants, like the Latinas and the Somalian community, and Ethiopians, um, a lot of East Africans. So one thing I realized is when you didn't speak a good English or you didn't understand your rights, certain managers will kind of abuse you or bully you or just treat you when it came to work safety. Um, second thing I noticed that there was, whenever you worked, is, so I worked at the Fulfillment Center in Shakopee and I did a Sunday to Wednesday 10 hour shift. In the winter it was okay, once the summer start hitting in, um, it start getting hot, the fans are above the sill, it does not reach you, so when you go and let the um, managers know like it is too hot, I need a break or do this, they tell you either you continue or you can go home. Like there's nothing they can do for you, which I thought it was not right, because as a human we have rights and safety come first. So the manager did not like me. They started calling me troublemaker. But I've spoken, <laughs> I've spoken out for a lot of Somalians. So one, one thing about the East African community, especially with my community, Somalian community, they don't pay attention to their rights. When they get a job, because a lot of immigrants, a lot of Somalian immigrants have people back home that depend on them, you know, monthly. They don't understand why you didn't send them. You know, for them, they're waiting like a paycheck. <laughs> So a lot of them fear to lose the job. So what I noticed Amazon use is they hire the most people who do not speak English at all. So they can do and abuse you, bully you however they want. So when I start doing the orientation, I start teaching people their rights, which I got in trouble. I was told that was not <laughs> my business to teach. I was supposed to just train and do that. But I told them a lot of people need to know they have rights when it comes to work. Like they can take a break, they can ask, if they get injured, they have the right to go to the nursing, which the nurse center really sucks. It's not a um, safety where they just tell you to lay down, give you some ice. So I noticed a lot of Somalians, Latinos who were injured. So I met with our center, and we, I organized a walkout. So when I noticed a lot of managers didn't care about some people, people were getting fired, because they literally hired 30 to 40 people every Sunday. You know, literally every week that I work Amazon, every Sunday we have a rotation. Over 30 people, out of those 30 people, only five or four stay after like a couple of days or a week or two. So I always go talk to them. So once I noticed the company did not care about the employees' work rights or the safety and I got injured and it wasn't that big a deal to them, I start organizing, letting people know that we do have rights, we can fight, we can go and speak, uh, and not speak, because we want people to hear our voices. A lot of people were afraid. But one night I just came in, and I saw a lady who was in pain, vomiting in front of me in this time of pandemic, and could not go home. Because in Amazon, they have a way that if you don't have hours, whether you're sick, they don't care. It's called a UPT. So either you have hours or volunteer hours if you don't have enough of them, not like other jobs where you can call in and say, I'm sick, because everything you deal with is an app. So you deal with the app. If you got to call in, everything you have to do days ahead, because they don't call you back within the right 24 hours. It probably takes 72, up to four days for them to return your calls, which a lot of people end up quitting because of that. So when we did the first walkout, that's when I met at Ward Center. I also work for Local 26, SCIU. So when I met Ibrahim and them, we did over 100 people. It was like over 100 walkout. And on Friday night, they did not think that's going to happen. But uh, <laughs> and that's one of the things I'm proud of. So we did the walkout. After the walkout, Amazon put a lot of people on UPT because most of the people who worked 
there and what did the walk I did not get paid through that night so everybody got either suspended or the um, time was taken or there was like oh you have to fill up your UPT which is like negative 60 or negative 10 hours so working with the woods and um, helping my community other communities to understand better to educate them better when it comes to warehouse working because a lot of warehouses do bully and I feel like work mistreatment and racism especially with religion because right now we fight we fought Amazon for two years to just get a place for Muslim people to pray or you know to wash out so I feel like fulfillment center where I was is a lot of racism there's a lot of favorism when it comes to different colors especially with religion so I was I always fight they do not like me like I said they always call me <laughs> troublemaker because I speak my mind <laughs> I, you know, we live this life in one, so I feel like if I'm gonna be the voice, I will. So my most main thing for me, I'm fighting for the workers, right? Just warehouses, Amazon, or any other warehouse, to understand this, they're people, they're humans. You know, we deserve to be treated right. Just because you work in certain position doesn't make you better than another person. So with a word center stepping in, and fighting and helping us. It's going to be a long fight, but we're still fighting. So for me, it's to educate that East African community yeah. and to understand that every job you go to, you do have a right not to be afraid to speak up. Well, thank you for sharing. And uh, I have to say, uh, being called a troublemaker, I usually consider that a badge of honor or a compliment, and so it just speaks to the good work that you're doing and uh, all the folks you're working with are doing. I, I just want to ask, what's the status of the organizing efforts um, more broadly in the Twin Cities area with Amazon and with SEIU? Like, what's how are things looking right now? Um, so it's, it's a little challenging because Amazon is denying a lot, and, and we're not the only city it's it's over 10 to 20 cities right now doing walkouts yeah literally month after month so for me i feel like it's a challenging because amazon do have a union busters yeah who work with them and they will go manipulate certain people and some of them are somalians um so we are working hard right now we're working with um wfs which i'm organizing there it's the cargo for the amazon mm -hmm. so hopefully if i can unionize there <laughs> it can help out the warehouses. Mm. So we're still working on the organizing. Um, I'm working on another walkout, hopefully soon, before the end of the month or next month uh, with the Fulfillment Center. Yeah. And what would you say has been, I mean, other than the fact that they hire very well-paid lawyers to come in and lie to workers about the organizing drives, which I'm sure is a challenge, but what would you say has been some of the most inspiring moments for you? I, other than the walkout, I mean, I, that's a big moment, but have been, there have been any smaller moments maybe where you've um, really felt the ability to, to grow power and to be able to, to get momentum behind these efforts? Uh, to be honest, um, just the fact that I work with a wood center. Yeah. You know, and the fact that we have a middle... East African community now, different from SCIU, where a lot of Somalians can understand. My um, thing is just to, to com my accomplishment, I just wish, want to win uh, and with Amazon, especially, like you said, they have higher lawyer pay, where they think they can win. Actually, they don't think they say they can win, <laughs> because they always told me, you're losing. So, most of it is getting the prayers where we can pray now because they didn't have that before. Yeah. So that's the most smallest for me that I get, but we're not there yet. So now we can pray and they give you 10 minutes for the prayer before they only gave you four and a half minutes, which was weird because you have to walk from a mile to a mile from the bathroom to the station that you're working. What do you think was the thing that caused them to, to do that? The walk up. We did the walkout, and I actually, after the walkout, we did a rally, mm -hmm. which Alhan Omar was there. Um, so I think after that, they kind of saw how serious we was. Yeah. So, because they didn't think we would have the rally. They didn't think we would succeed on that, which, you know, I did my best to make sure we gather as much as people as we can. But once that happened, a day later, they allowed us to celebrate Eid, which 
we had, you know, Amazon have the rights, religious rights, but they don't tell people. Yeah. So a lot of Muslims did not get to celebrate Eid, and p that pissed me off because I couldn't celebrate it. Yeah. I had to work or I had to quit. Uh, in between. So after Ilhan, after um, Award Center, that we did the rally the day after that, mm -hmm. they gave all the Muslims a day off, yeah. like a choice if you want to work or get a day off. So that was good. Yeah. I mean, I think just speaks to, you know, power is about changing behavior yeah. and getting people to, to do so. And I think it just really speaks to the work that you all have done, that you've been able to do that. So just congratulations on that. Can we give a round of applause real quick for Kelly?